Overlordly Broken Re. Chapter 39. Shadow of the Arena. Part 2. Written by Oblivion 2991. Clang. You damn, gua. Silent and elegant, the mysterious rogue cut the opponent's tendons, immobilizing him and making him fall to the ground. Ladies and gentlemen, give a round of applause for the winner team. Monstro and Grease. It was already the fourth match from the five-match-long second round. The only one who did not participate was Raiden, her chosen partner, and their two opponents. We will die surely. We will not survive this. On her side, the scrawny peasant boy muttered, trembling all in his body. The boy can barely hold his uniform short sword and round shield that was fixed to his forearm straight. Ha! And Raiden can only sigh hearing him speak. I am such a fool. Why did I think I had any chance? Why? Just why was I so desperate? The boy seemingly started to weep, can't bear the pressure as the two of them stood before the metal grid, waiting for the announcer to call their name and the portcullis to be raised. I am sorry. I must be looking pathetic, muttered the boy, all shameful about his cowardly display. What's your name? Am my name? He muttered, surprised, looking at the confident-looking woman on his side. Yes, Armias. My name is Armias. So, you are a peasant? Ye yes. Peasant and lower caste citizens only have one name. She learned this much during her stay here. The more name and title you had, usually the higher you stand in this society. Once I read a report about the royal family of re -Estais. They had so many names and titles it even leaves the most determined role player to dust. Well then, Armias, why did you come here? What is a peasant boy who fears the arena and death doing in this deadly place? The boy's expression darkened under his simple helmet, lowering his head. And my father is dead and mother deathly ill. Sister is forced to whore herself to earn the coin for our living, to pay our debts. They, he gulped, trembling unsteady. Tach the arena is our only chance. Normally, registration and participation have a high fee. Peasant couldn't possibly pay for it. Boo, but now, as it is free, the fallen fighter's compensation is enough to save them. To free my sister from that place and buy some medicine for my mother. I am willing to. He stopped suddenly, gulping hard. I, if my death is required to give them hope, then so be it. His knees started to tremble even more as he said this. It was visible he is not ready to die. He is a terrible liar. I see. So you are throwing your life away. I, I don't want to die. He started to shudder, eyes teary. But what other choices do I have? If I don't do something, my mother will die. My sister will eventually get sold as a slave due to our debts. There is no other way out. I see. Armias remained silent, clenching his fist. It was like this everywhere, not only this world, but their previous one too. Modern slavery existed. For example, the pharma corporations charged a ridiculous amount for medicine in 2138. Worse, if you can't pay, you needed to pay your debts through work. Of course, as you continuously need that medicine, you can never pay your debts. Even she, as a previous sickly person, can only afford her previous lavish lifestyle compared to most because she was a valuable asset for the corporation that raised her. They even paid some percent of her treatments and medicine to keep her alive until she can't provide any valuable assets of course, only doing so because they found her valuable enough to waste that much on her. Poor boy, in debt. His sister forced to whore herself, supporting a sickly old woman. They can hardly keep the gold once this ends. Once he dies and they receive the compensation, they will be surely mugged by the employers of the sister or someone else taking all the money away. That's why, I ask you, no, I beg you. Armias bowed deep. I saw you fight. Please, help me survive. Help, save my family. Raiden felt herself uncomfortable. She hated such dribbler confessions. Ladies and gentlemen, the last duel of the second round. The first pair you know well. They are long-time challenges of the arena. Rosvel and Grognak. The arena once more boomed, cheering for the pair. 
Indeed, the two were received well by the people too well if you asked Raiden. Rosvel, 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 Grognek, 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 Grognek. Outside, the barbarian grinned, inciting the people with his muscled arms to cheer for him. The frail-looking mage ignored the crowd, seemingly immensely annoyed by the cheers. And lastly, two new challengers, the timid Armias who barely got through the first round, and the mysterious Ronin. Welcome them with all your heart. The grid before the two started to rise slowly, making Armias gulp nervous. Well then, let's get over it. I'll do what I can. Just don't get in the way and do what I say. And maybe, just maybe, you'll survive this day. Ye yes. The kid nodded, filled with fear, still grabbed his weapon stronger, forcing some determination in his cowardly heart. Boo! Thought. The continuous booing didn't help his waning courage. As Raiden and Armias stepped out of the light, massive booing welcomed them. Raiden once more raised her arms, opening her middle finger, Armias following her timidly close behind, looking around while holding his round shield and sword closer to his body. The poor boy had little idea what the sign means Raiden so proudly showed to the people around. He was only aware they were not the favored side in this matchup which immensely worried him. S.H. should we give up? He muttered unsurely. Indeed, he wouldn't blame her who unluckily matched up with him if she leaves him behind just to save herself, or in fact, grab him and throw him against these two to gain a little bit of a chance for survival. Maybe his death serves some purpose then even if his life is worth nothing in the end. Do you want to give up? Well, haste. Elemental weapon. They already started buffing? Raiden raised her brow, seeing as the mage member of the group started to increase the capability of the barbarian with his spells, wasting no time with introductions. Boo buffing? Well, what does that mean? Poor boy, he had no idea what the mage was doing just now with his companion. If he would know, he most likely would crap himself. The only thing Armias recognized was the barbarian glowing up a few times while the mage chanting spells. Of course, it was more than enough for his dread to grow intensely as more and more pressure is aimed against the two of them. Indeed, with each spell cast on the towering man, the sheer power and pressure he released only grew. Well, it means, the mage is making his companion stronger by casting helpful spells at him. Raiden put it bluntly and short. And shouldn't we do something about that? It was a stupid question the boy knows well. But their chances were already slim right, non-existent from his point of view. In that case, his companion should do something with the situation, no? Nah. His companion is actually letting them finish preparation. Sitting down and leaning on her palm? What's wrong with her? If we attack them now, we will be disqualified instantly. Probably, she explained uncaring. Pro probably? Haven't you watched the matches until now? Before each duel took place, the sides got time to prepare and buff themselves. Then, shouldn't we also do that? I mean, you should do that. Well, I am neither a mage, bard, nor a cleric. I can't buff you. Can you do it? Of course, espers like her possess skills for buffing themselves or others, but as Raiden, she was a warrior-type character amongst those, an archetype that can't provide advantage for her teammates. Truly a miserable situation. Warriors also possess buff skills, abilities which can rally or remove different effects. Unfortunately, Raiden was not that type of person. Ho oh, how, should I know? I never participated in a fight before. In that case, we wait. The boy audibly gulped and whimpered. All his body trembled in fear. Indeed, he maybe will die here thanks to this incompatible getup. Ladies and gentlemen, let's the fight start. Begin. Let's start. Wasting no time, the barbarian used his immense, bulging leg muscles and basically shot out from his position, leaving only a dust cloud and a small crater in his wake. Ei, He is coming. What should we do? Chill, kid. Everything is under. Bang. Control. Wordless, the barbarian raised his weapon high, 
and with a practiced martial art strength and strike swung it down to Ronin. Her immense perception made the great weapon slow down, making the immense and fast barbarian look as he stuck in a time dilation field. Well, let's start at. Raiden pushed the boy aside gently, making him stumble farther away. Ag! Then, in the last moment, she twisted herself out from the immense strike of the double-edged weapon, only avoiding it by an inch. Bang! The weapon embedded deep in the ground, creating shockwaves that washed over the area and left a deep crater. In a moment, Raiden landed on the edge, pointing her short blade against the barbarian's left eye, pushing the blade towards the organ and injuring it. Careless! Gwah! The towering warrior backed in pain, and Raiden was on to raise the blade and knock out her opponent with her next strike. Yet, she jumped back at the last moment, sensing the attack the mage sent against her. Razor Wind Blades This usual area effect spell was hard to control, even harder to make it avoid allies and only hit opponents in the heat of the battle. Yet, the mage party member did just that, precisely controlling his winds, the razor-sharp pressure waves like a warm breeze hugged around Grognak, avoiding the barbarian and only causing damage where they intended. Not bad. Of course, Ronin, aka Raiden, jumped out of the way before the winds could catch her off guard. For the player with high agility like Isteth, Perceiving and avoiding such attacks was child's play. Look at that, ladies and gentlemen, not a minute in and the first blood already shed. What a marvelous display from the newcomer. Effortlessly, she injured the towering grognak. The crowd gasped, completely divided. Many booed the marvelous display, seeing it as mere trickery that ruins the fight. A lesser amount welcomed the surprise, enjoying the match. Grognak and Rosvel were still the fan favorite in this match, but few bet on Ronin. If she wins even one match, anyone who bet on her will win a great amount. You little nitwit! Grognak checked his ruined eye, only to recognize a deep cut in the middle of it, sprouting blood. A little more push and he would have been dead. Be careful! That one is dangerous! Rosvel muttered, making Grognak grunt and spat on the ground. You don't say. The barbarian grabbed his weapon with both hands, taking a serious posture. The that was amazing. Armias was amazed by Raiden's display on the side. Barely seeing anything. Yet, seeing enough how agilely and gracefully she avoided the attack, then injured the barbarian that was several times her size. As our mage friend said, don't get cocky. This battle is far from over. Raiden warned her companion notifying him about their still questionable situation. Rewrite. Although, as said, I don't think I will be much use here. Ignoring him, Raiden returned her attention to her opponents, who seemingly stopped, awaiting something, almost like measuring her. Ready. Ready. Once more, the barbarian changed posture, after consuming some of his healing potion, charged against Raiden once again. Clang. Clang. Clang, clang, a battle of attrition ensued between Ronin and the Barbarian. Her opponent learned, and he did it fast. Each strike of his became harder and faster, not once using the same posture or attack. A three. Rosvel, of course, did not sit idle. Keeping his companion in check, he started to bombard Armias. Leave me alone. Let me finish you fast, little boy be it was luck or any other factor, but somehow the boy was able to avoid all the spells that the experienced mage threw at him rolling, jumping, or twisting himself from the way or even the power of the explosion pushing him out of the way. It was almost like some unknown power or invisible hand helped him survive. Look at that. How lucky one can get. Despite all the odds, Rosvel unable to hit Armias even once. Luck of the first timers? Who knows? More and more frustrated, Rosvel started to concentrate his efforts to take out the boy. Die already! What the hell are you doing? Grognak shouted angered, frustrated as he couldn't hit his opponent. More and more, Rosvel thought the boy just pretended to be innocent, and in truth, he was a skilled fighter who just played around with him. Wah! What's grabbing me? Help! Armias, of course, was confused. 
As he tried to dodge, he often felt like something was pushing him out of the way at the last moment, or something miraculously happened that made the spell aimed at him change direction. Whatever was the case, it was both strange, hopeful, and scary that he was still alive. Damn it! Crack! Rosval! Look out! Somehow, Ronan managed to get past Grognak and like a flash was before the mage. Gwa! Only thanks to his instinct and reaction, Roskal managed to set up a barrier, but even like this, the sheer force which his opponent attacked was enough to break his nose and fly backward more than ten meters. Look at that! Is this the end of Rosval? Can he get back on his feet? According to the rules of the arena, during team fights until even one member can fight, no members are disqualified even if they lose consciousness. Rosval! Gah! It took several long seconds for the mage to regain his consciousness, feeling like he was hit on the head by a warhammer. If not for his hastily cast barrier, his head would be splattered on the sand of the arena. His vision blurry, his head ringing, he was sure he had a concussion. His only luck was the physical training he did to strengthen his body and pain tolerance despite being a magic caster. Are you all right? The barbarian retreated, forming a flesh barrier before his teammate, changing his posture purely defensive. His body was covered by small cuts. Despite their obvious advantage at the beginning, they started to lose their edge. TCH, they caught me off guard. He spat some blood, as well some of his teeth. Not as it mattered, it was not something that a healing spell can't replace. Immediately, he recovered a high-grade recovery potion, drowning it down with one gulp, pouring another on his injury directly. Tactic S. Asked Grognak, adjusting his grip on his weapon. Yes. The mage nodded, slowly recovering, starting to prepare his spell, his expression hardening as blood dripped down on his face from his slowly closing wound. Dark smoke. As Rosval cast his spell, immediately, thick, dark smoke filled the area around the participants, covering everyone's vision. It was like magical darkness of lower quality mixed with a smoke screen, hindering everyone's ability to see and hear anything inside. Hmm, interesting. I have never seen this spell before. I wonder if this was developed in this world. Is death pondered hard? Seabass often visited the magical association of re estais buying scrolls and enchanted items that contained spells not present in Yggdrasil. That meant new tier-based spells could be developed here in some way. This spell was almost like the mix of the rogue skill smoke screen and the magic called True Darkness, which basically blocked the senses of all who can't resist or lacked the ability to see through magical darkness or sense others through it. This ability is a lower tier than those two. Its effect is also weaker. The ability True Darkness also blocks all senses according to its description. But this only blocks hearing and sight. Even using True Darkness did not affect those who possessed True Sight like her, Dark Vision, or any magical vision or perception skills. It only really worked on lower levels and thus in high level during PvP was not really used. Ha! What's happening? Armias was clueless about what happened losing both his sight and hearing in this dark fog, trying to find a stable point and screaming without stopping. Fireball! Lighting! Around the poor boy, shockwaves washed over as spells bombarded the area, all aiming at Raiden, aiming to cause as much damage as possible, to catch Ronan off guard, imbalance her, and blow her to smithereens. Hmm, it seems even the user itself is hindered by his own skill somewhat. Compared to his previous shots, his accuracy dropped drastically. Previously, the boy only survived because she used telekinesis, barriers, and subtle luck manipulation to protect him. Not much just to make him survive and the enemy or others not to recognize her tamper. Why did I do that? Maybe pity? Even I don't know. Damn. I start to turn sentimental. Before her, the barbarian just waited almost like he would be the last line of defense before the mage who brought destruction forth guarding the ultimate Tower of Doom with great care. I think she sees through your trick, Rosval. The probability is high. Wordless. The mage waved his hand, casting another lightning bolt. It showed the man's immense skill with this spell as he cast spell after spell with great practice. 
He doesn't even need verbal components to cast his magic or very minimal ones. Only a very few were able to replicate this feat in the whole empire, including Flutter Paradigm himself. Though his resources started to run dry, he felt more and more drained with each spell cast. They need to finish this fast or they will lose. I can't see anything, scoffed Jerkniv, slightly annoyed as he sat in the VIP section, leaning on his fist. Should I order the organizer to do something, your majesty? Not necessary. Jerkniv sighed, leaning back in his seat, a small smile curling on his face as he hissed away his annoyance. Despite this minor annoyance, I enjoy this tournament. Hmm, may I ask, have you seen anyone worthy for the trials, your majesty? As you know, Basywood, I am not an expert myself. Maybe my Imperial Knights can help me in this matter. Hmm. Jerkniv glanced back at the two Imperial Knights behind him, raising his brow with a mischievous smile. Well, many promising individuals presented themselves today, I believe. In answer, the humble Imperial Knight can only bow and smile. Indeed, maybe we should recruit a few into the Imperial Army, then use them as a specialist. Jerkniv was intrigued by this idea his second knight offered. In fact, he as well wanted to make something like the scriptures of the slain theocracy. He already had a few ideas where such exceptional individuals could serve the best, which task force he should allocate them to. Everything was planned out in his head already. I am curious, according to you, what specialized units does my empire need the most? Of course, the bloody emperor, as his enemies like to call him nowadays, already knew what his empire lacked the most. Still, he always asked his subordinates. They might have a better idea that never came to his mind due to his higher education and cast of mind. Well, we still need a proper anti-spy measurement. Last time that assassin reached dangerously close to your majesty before we discovered him. Even remembering it, both knights felt shame. They didn't recognize that figure getting that close. Ah, yes, I remember. Did you manage to get anything out of that man? Not much, unfortunately. According to the torture master, some kind of necrotic poison was hidden in one of his teeth. Before he could have revealed anything useful, he killed himself. What a pity! The emperor sighed disappointedly. His continuous attempt to contact and recruit Izania, the mysterious assassin organization, until now was unsuccessful. How annoying! No matter how much I offer to them, they refuse to integrate into my empire and work only for me. I need to find competent people, or all my efforts will be in vain. He suspected that the assassin who infiltrated the palace and reached that close belonged to that organization. But... Thinking further into things, that would be too obvious or stupid. Even he can't decide. Yes, even Izania is not daring enough to aim for a monarch or this high. A few lowly nobles, they are not worth much. Their death creates a low amount of political echo. They are replaceable. But to kill a monarch? The royal families and everyone connected to them in the surrounding countries right away turn their attention on them if they do such a thing. Not only would they lose a significant source of income instantly, but a huge bounty would be placed on their head and let's not speak about their connection network would also weaken by this. They would not dare to risk something that stupid. Even the members of Izania are not that careless. Gwa! Look at that! The mighty Grognak flew out from the darkness. Turning his attention back to the arena, Jerkniv raised his brow. The previously proud barbarian laid on the ground, his body is full of bruises and cuts, losing consciousness in the next moment. His eye turned back. A few more explosions can be heard in the meanwhile from the thick fog before the noises of battle ended. And just like that, the darkness covered the ground and dispersed, leaving only two standing. This is, ladies and gentlemen, this is unbelievable. Roswell on the ground and out cold, both members of their team out cold. On the ground, Roswell lay unconscious. His eyes rolled up, face swollen underneath his mask, his body full with bruises, multiple of his bones broken. Armias meanwhile sat near one of the craters, grabbing his head, muttering something like, It is a bad dream. Yes, this must be a bad dream. 
around him, the area full of blast marks. The arena's sand either scorched or glassified from the magical heat created by the mage's continuous bombardment or the pulverizing strikes of the barbarian. Well, it seems we won, Ronin noted, looking around, sheathing her ninjato behind her back. Wa what? It was unbelievable. Even the fearful boy raised his head from his trembling state, blinking in unbelief. Wa what did you just say? Silence fell on the arena, watching the unlikely turn. That day many people lost a great amount, betting on the victory of Grognak and Rosval. That day one fighter defied all the odds, getting rid of not one but two veteran arena fighters alone. This means... The announcer remained silent for a moment, gasping in unbelief. Esteemed audience, your imperial majesty, let me introduce you the final two winners of the second round. Ronin and Armias, give them a loud round of applause and cheer. No one cheered for long moments. It was almost like they were dissatisfied with the outcome, or rather, displeased with how the fight went down. It must be really frustrating paying for the seats and unable to see the final moments of such an exciting match thanks to magical darkness covering the area. Well, what happens now? Timidly, the boy stood up, sneaked near Ronin, whispering. Well, we bow. In the next moment, Raiden made an elegant bow. The boy followed an example, though, a lot less gracefully. Owea! And thus, the crowd exploded finally, bursting out in the deserved cheers. Ronin! 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 Armias! 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 Ronin and Armias slowly left the arena while the crowd continued to cheer them. Fufufu! Your Majesty! Basywood raised his brow, rarely seeing his emperor so intrigued. Call those two here. I have an idea. Meanwhile, like the rest of the party, Raiden's group was also surprised by the result in the auditorium. Wow, that was strange. I didn't even see anything. Siller complained, definitely upset he was unable to see the conclusion from the thick darkness covering the arena. Hmm. Lady Alicia, is something wrong? Alicia looked upset for some reason, or more like concerned about what she saw down there even ignoring Iliaira's question for a moment. What? I asked, is something wrong? No, nothing. She sighed, shaking her head as she tried to dismiss the possibility. If you excuse me, I had enough of the arena for today. I am going for a walk in the city. Or more like check on something or rather someone. I agree. I will join you if you don't mind. Iliaira nodded in agreement. She likes the arena games just like back in her childhood, no matter how she tried to deny it. The matches were exciting until now, but she had enough for today. She felt something is bothering Alicia. In that case, she would rather not leave her unattended. As her people's guardian, it was her task to offer comfort and guard her traveling companions in need. Well, what's happening? Where are they taking us? Armias was nervous glancing left and right at the knights and escorted the two of them. It was for several minutes, their battle had ended, and right after they settled in their newly issued room to rest a little bit, two towering knights approached them in a fancy full plate, ordering them to follow. And thus, having really no other option, they followed the guards close behind. The arena was on a break before the last part of the series started, giving the duo at least an hour to meet whoever wanted to see them. I wonder who it is, some higher up, or someone else. As much as Armias, Raiden was just as clueless. Their way led through many stairways, reaching higher and higher. After each level, the lower level's gloomy corridors slowly changed to elegantly designed ones hallways resembled and made for nobles to walk amongst. Bland, stone walls were replaced by lustrous ones, covered by marble and gold decorations and paintings. These halls were definitely a place designed for high-class nobles to walk amongst. On the uppermost level, in an isolated section where no other people have entry, a strange sight awaited them. On the two sides, as they reached closer to a double-sided door, rows of elite knights stood, equipped with the best enchanted weapons and armor the Empire could offer, 
guarding whoever was behind that fancy. Finally, as they approached the door, two magic casters murmured a spell, checking them out for any suspicious items or enchantment. Leave your weapon behind. The towering, white plate wearing guard near the door ordered them after the magic caster whispered something to him. Well, what? Armias shuddered frightfully, more and more confused about what's happening. What is this place? Why did they call them here? Did they do something wrong? Whatever it was, he had a bad feeling about this. Leave every weapon behind. The knight repeated himself, sounding strict and stern. Raiden gives the nod to Armias. The weapon she used was a low-grade blade she conjured up. It will only disappear if she dismisses it or dispels skill cast on it. After leaving their weapons, the door opened, revealing a young, blonde man standing before the fireplace. Watching the flames almost mesmerized, two brown armored knights stood guard behind his back, akin, forming living meat shields. Thank you for coming. As he slowly turned around, it became evident his noble upbringing his every move was calculated and graceful, carrying the practice of countless hours, his smile never fading. His face was handsome, most likely the result of the carefully cultivated breeding. Eyes strange, like two amethysts, sat in those perfectly cut sockets, mirroring great care and burden. His hair was only the cream on the top, slightly curly and golden reflecting the magical light in the room perfectly, making him look like he wore it like a crown under the laurel that sat on the top of his head. That, Armias gulped deep, his knees trembling, starting to recognize the dashing young man. Let me introduce myself first, albeit you most likely already know me. The young man grinned, expecting his charismatic introduction to hit hard. I am the current emperor of the Baharuth Empire, Jerkniv Rune Farlord El Nix. Jerkniv smiled friendly. Previous, he ordered his knights and attendants not to start their usual introductory ceremony. In all actuality, he found personal introduction in such private meetings between parties he never met before much more pleasant and fun than letting others do it in his stead. Indeed, even the emperor of the Baharuth Empire found his small moments of joy amongst his numerous daily routines. That. Thud! Armias can't take it anymore and collapsed on the ground, blacking out immediately from the sheer excitement and unbelief. He, a simple peasant boy meeting Jerkniv personally? He never imagined, first surviving not one but two rounds in the arena, then the crowd cheered his name like some hero or champion. Now this, meeting the emperor himself. This was too much for his poor health. He immediately collapsed. Oh my! Jerkniv chuckled, pleased by his immense success. My introduction used to make a deep impression, but this? It never happened before. With an elegant wave of his hand, two butlers stood on the side and grabbed the young man, seating him on the closest couch elegantly. Leave us! And thus, the servants left, closing the doors behind themselves with just the wave of the emperor himself. So, why did you call us here? Raiden, A.K.A.S. death wasted no time, asked straight through. No hesitation or charm audible from her voice. Watch your mouth. You speak with his imperial majesty, the emperor of the Baharuth Empire. It is fine, nimble. Jerkniv gently waved away the sternness of his knight. I am sure she didn't mean anything bad. In fact, she is right. Let's not waste time with meaningless pleasantries. I understand. The blonde man with all enchanted gear lowered his head and stepped back, not complaining the slightest about his emperor's decision but accepting it almost wordlessly. Well then, let's get it done. I witnessed your prowess and technique in the last matches. And I must say, I am pretty impressed. My personal guards also evaluated your skills highly. Glancing at Basywood, the sturdy imperial knight lowered his head, nodding and agreeing wordlessly a small, gentle smile on his face all along present. Not speaking, you were able to protect this boy under the second round. True, he was skilled at dodging and surviving under this ordeal, but we all know, more is needed to win than simply surviving. Well, according to an old philosophy, if you survive, you are already a winner. 
Raiden mused in herself. You not only won but made out seemingly unscathed against two veteran fighters of the arena. Bravo! Jerknev clapped, offering his earnest expression. Tell me, I am curious, what happened under that darkness? Unfortunately, I was not able to witness the fight due to that obscurity. I would be glad if you can recount the events personally. Well, Raiden pondered for a moment. Suppose if you asked her, her opponents were pretty lame in Yggdrasil player standards. And she did not mean their lack of strength compared to her, but their faulty tactic that basically allowed her to win easily even without using overwhelming strength or anything out of the ordinary. Don't be shy. The match is over, you can tell me. Jerkniv smiled friendly, his hands interlocked behind his back. It was not much. Really, they just used the wrong tactic. How so? The Emperor blinked surprised. Even Basywood and Nimble gave each other a bewildered look. Well, the mage used a spell to connect his vision to the barbarian when he cast that darkness, akin to providing his companion limited means to see through the magical fog he created. Basically, this caused their downfall. That mage might be good and practiced using that spell, but connecting himself with the barbarian made him divide his attention. His aim was already off due to the imperfection of the spell that hindered his own senses as well. All in all, using this limited sense of theirs, I managed to confuse them, then knock out the barbarian first. This caused a backslash, leaving the magic caster vulnerable that allowed me to get close enough amidst his continuous bombardment and finish the job. Mages are squishy up close, a fatal weakness that can be used against them. Albeit, it is strange why he did not set up at least a respectable shield spell or any protection against spell connection backlash. Truly pitiful how this battle ended. Jerkniv and the knights listened with all their attention, their eyes wide, amazed by the thorough and professional explanation. Hmm. Very skillful indeed. Basywood nodded, accepting the explanation. Indeed some spells have a backlash that can be used against magic casters. If the warrior was knowledgeable enough, they could easily turn the tide. Although magic casters' apparent advantage over pure fighter types cannot be ignored that easily. Of course, to overcome this boundary, it required some arcane knowledge and immense skill from the warrior's part as well. The question still stands. How you were able to see through that magical darkness? Nimble squinted his eyes, slightly distrustful. Even using martial arts, he was unable to see through that thick fog. I didn't. In truth, I didn't see or hear anything. Of course, it was a lie, but let them think she was blind and deaf. It was more fun and cooler that way. You didn't? Then how? Jerkniv was giddy, curious how she did it. KHM, excuse me for my rashness. Please, can you explain it? Damn it. He lost his cool for a moment, yet it only took one more second to regain it. Your eyes are not your only senses. There is your ear, touch, smell, and of course, the distinct magical presence of people. Silence descended in the room for long moments. In the end, it was Jerkniv who broke it with his baritone laugh. Fuhahaha. It was a splendid explanation. I like you already. Raiden just tilted her head, finding the man strange. So... You still didn't say why you called me here. What's going on? Hmm, you are right. Please excuse my delay. As you know, as always, I seek people of great power to join my empire. In this case, you showed great promise. And? Ronin raised her brow. Though she meant nothing bad, it angered Nimble greatly. It was evident the man can barely hold himself to pull his sword and slice the woman in two. Only his emperor's order made him hold his hand. I see you are honest and feisty. I like that. Unfortunately, too many people around keep their opinion for themselves around me. That's why, and for the great show you gave us, I would like to offer you the chance to join my personal guards, the Imperial Knights. Both Basywood and Nimble gasped in surprise. Yo, your majesty. Boo, but she. Your majesty, please consider it. Basywood leaned closer to Jerkniv, whispering in his ear. You don't even know her. What if she was an assassin? 
only participating and calculating to get on your good side and strike you down when you are the most vulnerable. Both Imperial Knights were uneasy about this rash decision. This unknown figure could easily be a cutthroat. They can't be sure. No investigation had been made beforehand into who she is and where she came from. No background check. Nothing. A nobody participating in the arena, especially now as anyone can participate freely, might be an assassin. Now, they needed to be on their guards more than ever. Hmm, <clears throat> that might be true. Still, I trust my instinct. But to calm my faithful guardians, may I ask you to remove that cloth from your face? Like it would be a well-practiced move, Jerknev waved towards Raiden, on his face his friendly smile present all along. Well, Raiden saw something from the corner of her vision, a slight movement sneaking behind the Emperor. A shadow is vibrating, materializing from the dark corners of the room, slowly approaching the monarch of the nation. Flash! Wasting no time, wordless, she reached under her cloak, conjuring a set of enchanted knives and throwing it instinctively towards the opponent that somehow managed to sneak up on the emperor and was on to backstab him. Not even the imperial knights standing right next to Jerkniv recognized this figure covered by shadows and an invisibility skill. Yet, for Estetha's true seeing eyes, all this cover meant nothing. She saw through this farce immediately. Bang! The set of knives scratched Jerkniv's face as they passed his head, only barely missing to behead him right away. Hitting and throwing back the assassin that was on to slice the emperor's throat, ending his life immediately. It was a figure coated in a dark fog, dread, and a necromantic ninja costume. Indeed, if not for her quick action, Nimble and Basywood would not even recognize the attacker before it's too late, and their emperor's head fell to dust. I knew it! Not recognizing the immediate threat and the fact, Isteth just saved their monarch Nimble and Basywood jumped on the conclusion under a moment, pulled their respective weapons, both shielding and counter-attacking the strange figure at once. Clang! 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 Oi! Oi! I just saved his life! You think we believe that? They didn't even give her the chance to explain herself. For them, it was too obvious she was the culprit who tried to end the life of the ruler of the nation. Why can't people be reasonable? Just look behind you. We will not fall for that. Sensing no threat behind them after using martial art, the two Imperial Knights continued their assault relentlessly. Like many flashes, Raiden blocked the peerless cooperation of the two men with another dagger she just conjured. Their battle was like an elegant dance, neither side willing to give a room to the other. The two Imperial Knights worked together like one entity. It was visible they were trained to complement each other's weaknesses and fill the holes in offense and defense. Indeed, the Imperial Knights trained together from time to time, coming up with many defensive and offensive tactics. Not bad. Definitely better than that barbarian and his mage companion. Hearing the sound of fighting from inside, the Empire's elite guards immediately burst through the door, surrounding the fighting sides, forming a wall before Jerkniv immediately with this, easing the pressure on Nimble and Basywood, allowing them to concentrate on their offense. With the mages and present clerics filling the holes with barriers and using their magic to buff the two fighting Imperial Knights, the circle is closed, the pressure on Ronin grew immensely. Just give up. You can't escape. Basywood shouted seemingly cornering Ronin in one of the corners of the room. Nimble most likely wanted to end this invader, but would rather capture her if possible. Sorry, not my style. Isteth made a conclusion in her head. They're not likely to believe what she intends to say. Too biased to blame her as they didn't recognize the original attacker. In that case, it is better to escape. They don't know my identity anyway. Capture her alive if possible. Jerkniv requested from the backlands, slowly getting up as he fell on his butt after the dagger passed his face. Surrounded by his knights, he was utterly calm, carrying himself befitting to his position even in this situation. Albeit it was only for a show inside he was still trembling. That dagger which passed his face was too close for comfort. We'll do our best, your majesty. Ha! It cannot be helped then. His death just shook her head. 
not expecting she was left without detainment. If they can't speak, then testing the Empire's knights seemed to be a fun idea. Always make use of the situation that much she learned under her life. Sorry about it, but I don't intend to be captured. She could explain the situation that she only aimed at the assassin who was now lying dead and nailed to the wall. Yet, that would also be problematic. She would be forced to abandon her mission and spend more time than necessary in the Empire. I don't have time for this. The fact, these knights and mages completely ignored that person nailed on the wall and concentrated only on her and to protect their emperor was quite the measure of their dedication. Well, so bad. I need to fight my way out. Sorry if you get hurt. Clang. Clang. She blocked two more simultaneous strikes from the knights, seeing an opening lunged forth. Oh, you don't. Perfect coup. Gua. Javelin of. Gua. Both Imperial Knights gasped as they felt their body go numb suddenly. Something hit their chest really hard, denting their enchanted armor and pushing all air from their lungs. It was like their armor was not even there, hit by a full-blown warpick in the chest. Immediately they fell on their knees, only losing focus for a moment. Still, it was well enough for Ronan to speed away from them, running towards the door, knocking out the mages and knights in her way picking up the still unconscious boy, and only by an inch away, missing the emperor as she ran past him. The mere wind of her speed knocked the guards prone in her way. Like a summer storm, she disappeared under a moment, leaving the VIP section and bursting through the reinforced walls like they were made from glass. She made the impossible seem too easy. Not only was she able to hold her own against not one but two Imperial Knights at once, but the first time in history, she managed to escape the Emperor's elite guards and also, the clutches of two Imperial Knights who aimed to either capture or eliminate her. With this, unknowingly, she earned a name to herself and a hefty bounty to her head. Your Majesty! Damn her! Basywood and Nimble recovered under a moment, running to check their Emperor worrying he was injured. Worse, dead thinking death not even caught up with him after a deadly strike. Get on your feet! Nimble ordered the guards harshly, not tolerating any blunder in the defense. I am sorry, my emperor, we were too careless. I, it is fine. Jerkniv needed a moment to recover, even losing his always calm composure for a few seconds as he loosened his collar a little. That was too close for his taste. He almost left his teeth in this room. Search for her. I want her thrown into a cell and questioned. Nimble right away gave his order and several knights ran out from the reinforced VIP room, starting their investigation of the strange gladiator. Your Majesty! What? Jerkniv almost snarled, only a moment later regaining his usual noble attitude. Yes? What do you need? Look! As Jerkniv turned his head, his eyes widened. What was nailed on the wall was a man in strange attire, still partially covered by smoke-like shadows translucent from the fading invisibility spell that hit him until now. Why would she kill her own companion? Nimble questioned, his voice filled with suspicion and disbelief. Maybe she as well was deceived, muttered Jerkniv, inspecting the corpse on the wall. Oh, how interesting. GG. The next moment, the elderly voice of Flutter came from his side. You were late. You said you would come immediately if I activate this ring. Yet, you didn't come. Jerkniv raised his hand. A strange magical ring adorned one of his fingers. On his face all along an angry, more so dissatisfied expression. This kind of application of shadow magic is marvelous. Flutter muttered, caressing his long beard and inspecting the assassin who was still nailed on the wall. Murmuring and casting a few spells to analyze the method and spells lingered in the air. Indeed, just now, he ignored what Jerkniv said just to satisfy his curiosity. GG. Oh, yes, sorry about it. I would have come immediately, but something blocked my teleportation spell. It was odd. I never encountered something like this. Albeit, Flutter put it like this, but in his eyes, Jerkniv only saw the lights of excitement. Like a giddy child who finally found something that interests him. Your Majesty. We found no other assassin around. 
Bazywood reported in the next moment, his knights and the mages finishing with their survey. It is dangerous here, your majesty. I advise retreating to the imperial palace and reinforce the defense. All four of us might also be needed to guard you day and night. We should also ask Flutterdano's help to set up defenses against possible assassins. Bazywood glanced at Flutter, who just waved him away, akin to saying, Sure, sure, whatever. And I know it is inappropriate, but, but, we should also delay the coming gala of the founding day. You said what? Jerkniv glared at his imperial knights, even raising his voice, almost burning a hole in Bazywood's head. Nimble was still busy organizing his men nearby. It was his only luck else. He as well would have received his fair share of scolding glare. I mean, with two attacks in such a short time, it is clear they aim at you, your majesty. Please understand, without your leadership, the empire will crumble. Our enemies will tear us apart. Hmm, that's true, muttered the emperor, recalling the events that happened so fast he can barely perceive them watching the nailed person on the wall for a moment. Gwa! Suddenly, the assassin regained his consciousness or more like somehow came back to the world of living spitting black blood, opening his eyes slowly as he glared at the emperor with his fiery, hateful orange gaze. To damn you! He groaned in pain, trying to remove the enchanted dagger from his throat. It was unknown how he could survive such a wound, but it definitely meant he was dangerous despite losing that much blood and wounded that critically. Juj, ha ha. After removing the dagger from his throat, he dropped to the ground, his eyes full of hate towards Jerkniv. But there was something else, confusion? Yes, he was definitely confused, touching the wound on his throat and watching the struggling shadows around his arms. Detain him, throw him in our most well-guarded jail. Make sure he survives. Gigi, I entrust this to you. I want to know who sent him. Call the torture master if necessary. He will make his tongue loosen. Two elite guards grabbed the struggling assassin who barely hung on to life, shackling him with magical bindings Flutter lent them and dragging him out. Jerkniv pondered for a moment, glancing at the trail of blood left by the assassin's wake. Should he hide? Should he cancel the oncoming gala? But what will happen then? He will surely lose face. Worse, the people's trust not speaking. He will turn the laughing stock before all the noble houses and the nearby nations, both before his supporters and his enemies who are scheming behind his back. I am sure some of them can be tied to this. Nobles and his enemies were like vultures. If he shows weakness even for a moment and hides, he will turn into a laughing stock. Worse, this will give his enemies the perfect opportunity to deface him and support their claim to the throne. Despite being the emperor and currently most of the nobles supporting his rule, his power was not wholly solidified yet. It is based on his fearless attitude and his iron-fisted rule that leaves no compromise. If he shows weakness even for a moment, they will try to replace him without question. Worse, even more will be encouraged to send more assassins or question his claim. After my bloody ascension to the throne, I left many previously great noble houses in shambles, executing those who were against me or were traitors. Ordinary people loved him for the reforms he made. He created an empire under a short time where heritage was less than a factor. Instead, with hard work and service, one can ascend from a peasant to a noble. Yet, this left him with many enemies all around the board. Not even great noble houses were spared from his crusade to cleanse his empire from the filth that was corrupt nobility. Unfortunately, no matter how hard he tried, dirt and cockroaches always found a place to hide from the cleansing fire. In this case, he suspected those still hiding corrupt nobles, or the descendants of the ruined houses plotted their revenge. Or even an outside party that eluded my attention? Jerkniv can't say for sure and it is immensely bothered him. Only one thing was sure if he hides now. If he does not appear in public or even cancels the oncoming gala, that will be the first step of his fall. We will not cancel the gala. His expression hardened, already formulating many plans and scenarios to catch whoever sent the assassin. Indeed, 
the emperor showed absolute resolution and courage at this moment. I will not hide like a scared child. If these people want my head, let them come. I will await them prepared and with elegance. I trust my people, my guardians. I will not fall, but overcome this obstacle and rise even higher. He turned to Basywood and Nimble, and both loyal knights bowed. We will do our best, your majesty. We will not fail you again. You can entrust your protection to us. Humph. Good. I expect no less. They might fail to complete their duty this time, but everyone can make mistakes a mistake that almost cost his life yet. Without the trust of his most loyal guardians, he would not be able to reach this high. Indeed, if even they can't protect him, then not many can in the entire continent as his knowledge dictates. The only question remained in his mind was the mysterious identity of the strange gladiator who not only saved his life, but in a short time, disabled two from his imperial knights, his elite knights, and even ignored the clerics guarded him not speaking, the mage's flutter handpicked for his protection worth notch against the stranger. More so, to mock him and his empire, this fighter escaped without seemingly any injury. He offered the cream of his empire, yet, it was worth nothing before this girl. Who was that mysterious gladiator? And where did she come from? Very few people came to his mind who should be able to achieve such a feat, and none of them were the direct enemy of his. None of them has the reason to hide their identity or attack him in such a shady way. That means? One more possibility came to his mind. An improbable scenario, but considering the report stated, her arrival in the capital, he can't ignore this possibility. Your Majesty, Basywood walked near him, whispering something in his ear. Ah, I see something interesting. A big grin moved on his face. He is one step closer to solving this mystery. The party of this year will certainly be interesting. Fu 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 fu. Jerkniv chuckled mysteriously, making the surrounding knights feel anxious by only being near their emperor making Flutter caress his long beard faster and raise his brow, intrigued. Don't worry, my mysterious savior. You will be rewarded for your service. As for my enemies, this will be their funeral party. With that, the emperor returned to the imperial palace, his imperial knights and elite guards guarding him like never before on top of this, even Flutter accompanying him to make the necessary preparations. One thing is sure. They will never let him be alone anymore. That day, the emperor came up with the perfect plan to draw out his enemies and get rid of whoever aiming for his life once and for all. It was time to clean the house once again, and he will not be merciful like he was last time. Oh boy! He was sure the streets of Arwintar would see more blood than last time. This time, he will leave no loose ties. Scene change. Embassy of the Elven Kingdom near the imperial palace. Phew! That was close. After returning to the embassy, Raiden threw the boy on the nearby couch, laying in her luxurious bed, removing the scarf that covered her head. It was a long day, many exciting and strange things happened. Well, it was strange to say so. She had fun in the arena. Too bad it was cut short by this little incident. In truth, she wanted to reach the finals, see what rewards she will receive. Oh well, it is not a problem. I bet on my win in this round for a great amount. Considering the odds and the number of people who bet on my group's failure, I will gain a hefty amount even without any further rounds. She sent a shapeshifter demon to bet on her win, first betting on her survival in the first round, then her team's success in her second. She was curious about the arena. That was her main reason for going there at first. She wanted to test the nation's fighters and her own skills. Yet, when she heard about the ridiculous amount of state-supported gambling in this event, she can't help but make a bet with a generous amount. Nazarick stretched too thin already, both considering workforce and financials. Even if she and Mamanga worked overtime as adventurers and earned a great amount already, they struggled to satisfy the numerous ongoing projects' monetary needs. Not speaking, we need to support a lavish lifestyle thanks to our adamantine adventurer status. Honestly, currently, it was more of a hassle than worth it. True, they gained quests that paid a ridiculous amount compared to this world each time they completed them, 
defying all odds and expectations whenever they asked to do so this earned them great renown and even more assignment, of course. Even so, all this renown and their adamantin rank also restricted them from taking lower-ranked quests. They did so already a few times since growing into adamantin rank, and this earned them the scorn of the lower-ranked adventurers even the guildmaster asked them not to do so as it is taking out the living from the mouth of other adventurers. In that case, they can only really answer direct requests or the quests designed for their difficulty level. This, of course, greatly reduced our income from adventuring. Of course, Rorschach always reported his great success in creating a stable and lawful business in the capital, planning his expansion soon. I need to visit him and request a personal report. It has been a while since we met. At first, she only wanted him out of her hair as she found his style annoying. At once, she also wanted to assign him to a task she can profit from and make him a little bit useful creating a business to earn income and build connections through she can collect information about this world and about the presence of other players and dangerous elements. I wonder what he is up to, she muttered, turning to her side. The other potential big income source hopefully will come to fruition soon. The reports zero sent from his project's progress seems to be progressing well. Hopefully. All of these can earn us enough to lessen the strain. As she started to think about the demi-human villages they conquered and what happened with the people there, the door burst open, revealing a really angry Kitsune. You? A really familiar female voice hit her ears. A sharp one as it. Slam. I know it was you. After slamming the door shut, Isteth turned to the woman who just burst into the room without even knocking. She was so immersed with her memories. She couldn't even hear and felt the arrival of Alicia at first. Ah, Alicia Chan, what are you speaking about? She smiled awkwardly. Yet, she suspected what the fellow Kitsune player meant by this sentence. You know damn well what I am speaking about. I know it was you in the arena. Just look at your clothes. Or should I call you Ronan? It was really transparent giving herself that name also, not really creative, the girl started to suspect since the moment she heard that oddly familiar title. Ah, Alicia Chan. Raiden now stood up, starting to back away. I can explain. Honestly, girls were scary. Really scary. Especially this one. Even with her powers, she doesn't really want to get on her bad side. Well then, pulling out a chair, she sat down legs and arms crossed, glaring at the supreme being. You can start here and now. I await your explanation patiently. And hey, what is that boy doing here? Isn't he? Oh my god! You kidnapped him? The boy still slumbered peacefully on the couch, even drooling on the expensive pillow. His death made sure to sedate him before bringing him here, not to wake up and start to panic accidentally. Explain. Now. Is death gulped, suspecting she can't get away from this trouble that easily. Indeed, that fiery glare was the guarantee she can't explain this that easily. Scene change. Swamp. Near the Great Lake, the war with the terrible demonic horde took a great toll on his people, as well every other demi-human who joined their resistance. They fought until the end. Fought until hope decayed into the marrow of despair. And in the end, they triumphed and survived. Of course, it was not out of their unbreakable spirit and ceaseless resistance they did so. The fact they fought until there was no hope even dying for their cause in his case and it's worth noting, in the end, was disappointing enough. They made it out to the next day only out of the mercy of the great supreme being and her servant. The being who graced with them with a new chance, doing what their joint effort was unable to reach, and eliminating the terrible horde and its leader with just a mere move. It was inspiring and dreadful all at once. All it took was a tilt of her head, not even raising her finger, as the elders boasted with their meeting with the supreme being their new goddess and ruler, and the terrible demon leader dispersed into nothingness. Her servant's mere presence turned the demons into a pile of scorched ash, cleansing the swamp and the whole lake, shining like light never before purifying their world in the image of a never-ending sun. Her servants are many and boundless, her power endless, bringing forth whole worlds with a mere thought. Those who met her personally described her as a divine being, both horrible and magnificent, yanking their whole world into her own. 
judging the attacking demon lord here, without any pity or consideration. She gave her a declaration. She gave them a choice. Refuse her, and they might die from the next wave. She will not help them when darkness comes for them next time. Their second choice is to serve her, and they will grow and prosper. In return, they will pay the price when called for it. In return, they become her soldiers when the time comes. That was the declaration the elders brought from her. Vault really hoped it would be not their end. So much changed. Walking around their new and thriving village, Vault looked around. It has been some time they survived that night, starting to rebuild and live in the chosen area which their new guardian angel, the herald of their new deity, selected for them. Here they work together with close symbiosis with all the survivors who decided to stay with them. Strangely, after the accident, not one of them decided to leave. It was either out of fear of the dark deity that will hunt them after their spawn's failure, or even out of the companionship the survivors felt after they survived such an ordeal. Indeed, everyone felt much safer in the new village that was protected by the Supreme Being and her servant, Lady Oriel. Hmm. Just looking at the new statue built in the middle was enough to bring them some peace. A seat where the Supreme Being sat on her sides, her two servants stood Lady Oriel, the Bright Lady and another strange masked humanoid they still didn't give him a name. The new symbols of enforcement and hope. Yes, their people were not skilled in the art of sculpting, but the angels helped to build this village did a splendid job creating this memento of their masters. This statue, as well this village, was their gift and memento of their years of coming service. All around, the villagers thrived. Never before, he saw so many demi-humans working together. Not infighting, but helping each other. Sturdy walls all around this new village were molded by strange magic, situated in a place they can hunt and fish safely. Their pantries filled with food in never-seen amounts and quality, another gift from the Supreme Being. All of them accommodated according to their needs. None of them suffered or lacked anything. Maybe this catastrophe needed a new start. He muttered, chuckling sourly patting Riska on her side, a gesture his faithful mount and companion only raised her brow worriedly. Q. Indeed, before this, their village struggled not only with the surrounding dangers and the different demi-human tribes around, but with the change of leadership, internal oppositions, and the chaos Gritch their last king brought forth in his ascension to the throne. Our rapidly dwindling number didn't help either. Indeed, their downfall as a community started long ago. This invasion only finished it. And yet, we survived, rising stronger than ever. Vault didn't know if it was sad or joyful. He was only glad he and Raki survived and their people are recovering from the terrible event. Halt! What's your business here? His attention turned towards the two-sided gates where two ogres, Armat and Toadman, stood guard, spotting a familiar figure sitting on the top of a strange hydra. Zeriusu, Roraro? He cut a wide path through their new village, approaching the main entrance to confirm if his eyes were not deceiving him accidentally. People followed his every move another annoying thing came with his survival and new responsibilities. Now, they think of him as some kind of miracle child, a saint, or even a hero, one of the chosen ones fought for their freedom and brought back to life by their new chief deity. Honestly, all these adoring gazes sometimes were hard to bear. Nonetheless, all that extra food and all those females offering themselves for him to carry his seed was not bad. Vault! Zeriusu waved, his old friend offered a wide grin, his brown scales losing not their luster, but grew sturdier since he last saw him. Indeed, their first meeting was a battle between their tribes. Ever since many things happened, many things changed. It is good to see you, friend. Zeriusu jumped down from the back of Rororo grabbing each other's forearms like good friends. Q. Grr. Riska and Rororo also welcomed each other, albeit it was just a running gaze, nothing else. Their attention focused on Vault and Zeriusu, giving them their own type of welcome. Okay, okay, big guy, I missed you too. Vault patted the side of Rororo, wiping away some of his saliva from his fur. Do you know them, Vault? King. 
asked another guard. Definitely not an Armat one as most Armats he fought together still called him by his name, treating him as a fellow warrior fought side by side with them. Yes, you can say that, grinned back the man. Oh, you are a chieftain now, Zeriusu asked wide-eyed, never expecting his friend to rise so high in their next meeting. Long story, Vault just shrugged, annoyed. Despite the apparent advantages, he hated the responsibility that came with his new position. It was bothersome enough the elders and his people chose him as their new leader and with this, forcing him to be their representative in the racial council where every race represented themselves in this new demi-human alliance. Now, as he knows his old friend, he also needs to bear with his coming puns. Ha ha ha, I never imagined. Don't even say. Vault sighed, shaking his head. So, why are you here, old friend? We tried to reach out to your people, but we failed. You as well? He feared the worst, the suspicion that was confirmed with Zeriusu's next sentence. Yes, we were attacked by the undead. Undead? We were attacked by demons. It is possible two distinct enemies attacked them? Or this dark lord sent different evil against the two sides? Vault didn't know and it immensely worried him. Oh! Zeriusu blinked, surprised, never expecting such a turn. Then that means we were attacked by a different enemy? Most likely. The two friends stared at each other for long moments. In the end, Vault spoke first. Come, let's drink something. We can discuss what happened while we eat something. I bet you and Rororo are famished. As I remember, the encampment of your tribe is a week away. Q. Grua. Both Riska and Rororo expressed their agreement, albeit Riska didn't travel for a long distance like Rororo to get here. She was always hungry, maybe her visibly growing belly has something to do with this. Sounds good, albeit, I was sent by Lord Cositus to discuss certain matters. I rather not delay the task the Herald of the Supreme One give us. Another Supreme One? They just pop up in these marsh-like flies. Vault almost found it too ironic. Indeed, it seems too timely that they were attacked around the same time and offered salvation by these beings just as well. I wonder if this other supreme one also connected to ours? Or they are the same? Vault had no idea, and it somehow bothered him. Nonetheless, he will ask about it later after Zeriusu's official business is conducted. His friend said it right. It is not wise to make a supreme one wait. Neither is it advised to do so with their herald who most likely reports the supreme ones directly. Very much seems so. Well then, let's finish with the official business, then we can exchange stories. Good, follow me. Vault nodded to the guards to return to their post. And thus, Zeriusu followed him through the village. What message did he bring? Even Vault can't suspect. Scene change. Back in the elven embassy. I can't believe you did just that. Alicia's eyes still twitched. After each detail, Raiden told her. She became more and more infuriated. You said you needed a day off. You said you have official business you have to take care of. But this. You just went to have fun in the arena. Well, I actually also bet on myself. And won. Quite a sum. Why am I not surprised? She looked away with a disappointed expression on her face. If you ask this death, she somewhat felt bad for not telling Alicia about this little detour. It was a strange feeling she hardly felt before. But why did she feel remorse doing what she wanted? Why was it a wrongful feeling doing what was right for the sake of Nazareth? Was it a sin to feel herself well after all those shitty years she spent on Earth? Or was she simply disappointed I didn't tell her about my little detour? She was confused more than ever. Despite being a girl for a few months, she still can't understand them. All of this was too confusing and messy. Why can't they be more straight what they want? Looking at Alicia, she just glared at her. Not saying a word, just pure glare. The disapproving look of disappointment was worse than the water torture. Despite all the power she gained after her transportation, she can't help but feel intimidated by that glare. It makes me remember the times when Bukabukagama and Yumeko scolded us after one of our pranks with Pararoncino and Ulbert went wrong. 
Well, Bukabukagama more like screamed with them. Yumeko just lectured them why they shouldn't do this like a teacher figure she was. Strangely, when angry, Bukabukagama's voice resembled the one she used for her lowly characters in H games. And it was not that cutely angry voice. It was the terrifyingly angry voice of a wrathful goddess who took the form of a lowly. It just made her even creepier and, at once, scary. Ever since she got to know that her guildmate lent her voice to such games, she was reluctant to try them out more often ones advised by Peroroncino. The kinks of that man knew no bounds. Ever since I always checked the list of voice actors. Even I have my limits. Look. Alicia sighed, bringing Estetha's attention back to her. I get it. You want to be independent and use this new chance to feel good yourself. And I should be glad you provide me means of protection, luxury and all, allowing me to travel with relative safety with you, and not letting me be alone in this world. But still, we are supposed to be companions. How can I trust you if you don't tell me about such a thing? Isteth just stared at Alicia, legs closed together as she sat on her bed like a statue. I may seem like a drama queen to you just now. Sorry about that. The Kitsune player lowered her head, almost looking like a sad puppy even her ears moved accordingly. You don't say. Isteth deadpanned. Still, we are in this together. I don't expect you to tell me everything, as I respect the private sphere. Everyone has secrets, even me. But you should tell me important things like this. Think about it. If you suddenly disappear, and I can't answer that skeleton guy, Mamanga, his name is Mamanga. Yes, that fellow? Alicia pointed at his death after snapping her finger. Anyway, if you suddenly disappear, he will question me. And if I can't answer, I will be the one to blame. And after that, who knows what happens? Ah, I am sure Mamanga would not hurt you even if I disappear. He is a reasonable person, after all. Maybe he is not. Maybe yes. I don't know him enough. Not as much as you. In truth, Alicia and Ains barely exchanged a few words since his death invited her to that tomb. Still, I am more worried about your servants and the other people of this tomb of yours. Most treat me like trash since I set foot there. Treating me like a servant meant to serve you, even though you told them I am a guest. They give only the bare minimum respect and care. What do you think will happen with me if you disappear, and I can't answer where, or what you did under your absence? I, Look, I get it. You want to have fun. But consider others as well. With great power comes great responsibility, you know? Alicia tried to tease Raiden even winking to ease the tension. But it just made it all worse. It just made his death feel even more remorse. Knock! Knock! Lady Alicia, Lady Raiden. Someone is looking for you. Coming from the Imperial Palace. Alicia and Raiden looked at each other, the Supreme being proceeding to open the door. Yes? Who is it? Someone from the Imperial Palace looking for you too. At once, in the reception, he said it is important. The elf maid bowed, giving the utmost respect to the two before leaving. Looking at each other, the two adventurers proceeded, going down in the reception where a pompous-looking, chubby figure and several knights already awaited them. Lady Raiden? Lady Alicia? The herald asked, speaking with a heavy accent and like an aristocrat, even raising his head and showcasing his heavy double chin. This man who brought forth their message basically has no neck under all that fat. His aristocrat hair that curled up in the ends, his small, straight mustache settled under his nose, and his comically thin legs compared to his body made him look more like a caricature than a real human. Yes, Kachem, clearing his throat, the man recovered a scroll under his gold-lined vest, opening it and starting to read aloud. From His Imperial Majesty, Jerk Navroon Farlord L. Nix Magnanimous Care, Adamant and Rank Adventurers, Alicia of Riestais, and Raiden of Riestais officially invited to the Gala of the Founding Day as guests of honor. Both of them are eligible to bring a one-plus person as their guests. Appearance is not mandatory but highly advised. Clothing and dress fit to the occasion mandatory. And thus, the man started to read the scroll further, listing every unnecessary detail that, in the end, 
was a hassle even to listen to stretching long minutes as he listed all the points the invitation entailed. In that light, His Imperial Majesty hopes and expects your presence in two days, on the night of the founding. Regards, the Emperor of the Baharuth Empire, Jerk Navrun Far Lord El Nix. With that, the chubby figure closed the scroll, and the servant on his side brought forth a fancy pillow with just as fancy enchanted scrolls settling on it. The scrolls are enchanted, containing the invitation and the permit to cross the gates of the Imperial Palace on the night of the founding. Please don't lose them, as they are unique and not replaceable. His Majesty expected your presence as well, prepared a special welcome to the esteemed guests. Please do not disappoint him. Bowing elegantly, the stoic herald left, and with him, the knights and servants escorted him. Silence descended in the embassy hall as the servants, officials, and even the elven ambassador can only stare at the two adventurers bewildered and gaping like a fish. What? Raiden and Alicia don't even suspect how honorable this invitation was, and certainly didn't expect the trouble that will await them at this party. What awaits them next? Read further and find out.